Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be the last video in the little mini series that we've been doing about swapping the rear axle on my GMT 400 K2500 Suburban from the 14 bolt full floater to a Dana 70 Super Chevy Express van axle. Now the whole reason this project started was because I really just couldn't stand how the narrow track width looked from the old 14 bolt right down there. But along the way, I figured it might make sense to do this conversion if I was also gaining, you know, disc brakes and a limited slip because this is still a 410 ratio like the uh, 14 bolt that came out. But today we're gonna go over some of the challenges that I've experienced and am still going through, still trying to figure out specifically with the braking system. We're gonna talk about the cost, like how much did this whole thing cost? Because wheel spacers definitely would have been a whole lot cheaper, but I really knew that going in. And then finally, we're gonna see how this thing actually drives because I know a lot of you guys were concerned down in the comments that this thing wouldn't be able to track in a straight line down the highway or even turn around in like a parking lot or a drive through because supposedly the rear axle was designed narrower to help both driving straight and turn. So not exactly sure how that's gonna work, but we'll put it to the test and see how this thing is gonna do. And we'll start by talking about some of the challenges I had with the rear brakes, specifically with the caliper. So one of the major benefits of swapping this particular axle is the rear disc brakes. Now they're not just any disc brakes. These are pretty heavy duty. They're designed for a one ton van. They have two piston calipers and really heavy duty rotors. So they'll definitely add a whole lot of stopping power to this Suburban. But whenever I started bleeding the brakes on the rear passenger side, I noticed the caliper was hanging up. It wouldn't release and let the rotor spin freely. But that was actually my bad. It turns out the caliper was just fine. I actually had the brake pads in the wrong position. Now, when I took them out of the package, these are power stop pad, or everything's power stop actually. Um, and there was two groups of brake pads kind of shrink wrapped together. So I figured there's a left and then there's a right. Uh, but it turns out it was actually the insides were together and the outsides were together. Now I took the pads apart or out of the packaging and I kind of compared them really quickly. I just glanced them over and they appear to be almost identical. And the dot, there's a couple little dots on the back of most brake pads to kind of help hold them in place and move around certain things. And just glancing at it, they look to be identical. So I didn't think much of it and I put them in and I went on my way. And that's when I kind of started bleeding the brakes and I realized something was wrong. Now, as it turns out, those little dots I was talking about, they make a really big difference. Um, this is an outside pad. You can kind of see how that little dot just sits right in the middle of that open spot on the caliper. But I had both inside pads on one side of the truck. So basically the round piston on the back side was just hitting right on the edge of that guy there. Um, so I actually did order another caliper and I, I didn't really need to, but this is what happened. You can kind of see this little spot right down there. That is actually where that little bump, if I can get this thing to focus, right there. That little bump or that damaged or bent over spot is where that lump on the back of the pad was contacting. And the, the piston would not push squarely against the pad and it kind of jammed up in there just a little bit. And that's why the caliper gave the symptom of sticking even though it wasn't really. So I ordered another one and I just threw it on because I didn't really like that damaged spot in there. Um, not a huge deal, it would have run just fine. But once I actually swapped the pads to their appropriate location, insides on the insides and outsides on the outside, um, it, everything worked perfectly. It didn't stick anymore. The caliper spins freely or the rotor spins freely when you let off the brakes. And I finished bleeding and then now we're ready to move on to the next thing. But Real quick, let's talk about bleeding the brakes on these GMT 400 trucks because it can be a little bit tricky. So one of the biggest complaints about these GMT 400 trucks that you'll find is spongy or squishy brakes. Now, that usually is a symptom of air being trapped in the system somewhere or a bad master cylinder. Uh, but I tried something that I learned just last night from a YouTube video on the internet, and that's bleeding out the Kelsey Hayes ABS module. Now this applies to the, I believe like 96 and up GMT 400 trucks with that style of ABS module. And there's an access port that's covered by a little plastic cover right on the back here, kind of right by my blue rag. Um, and you can pop it off and there's a little valve right down inside, get that out of the way, right down there. And as you push the brake pedal, this valve actually kind of moves in and out. But if you push it in first before you press down on the brakes, a little fluid will come out. 
So you kind of bleed that guy just like you would, you know, bleed any part of the brakes normally. And you'll get a little bit of extra air out of that. So I gave it a shot and then I continued to bleed the rest of the brakes just like normal. Now, unfortunately, I'll talk about this more in a little bit, but I was going to do some changes to the master cylinder. But um, I noticed one of the bleeder screws on the right front caliper is actually broken off, which means I can't bleed the front half of the system without replacing the caliper. And I don't want to do that just yet, which I'll talk about in a second. But anyway, uh, once I got the ABS module kind of bled, I moved on to bleeding the back brakes. I did have to pump quite a bit of fluid through there just to get all the air bubbles out. But now we've got no air in the system that I can tell, so our brakes should be bled and should be working fine. So now let's talk about the next changes that we should make for the braking system, talking about the master cylinder. So you're going to have a different master cylinder between trucks that had four wheel disc brakes and discs in the front and drums in the back. And one of the most popular workarounds for that in a GMT 400 truck is simply grabbing a GMT 800 master cylinder, bolting it on and going down the road. So I grabbed two of them, one from a 2500 HD with Hydro Boost, one of them from a half ton with vacuum boost brakes. And they both have the same bolt pattern here. They both have the same bore on the outside of this guy right here that slides into the booster. Both have the same half inch fittings. The reservoir is slightly different. Um, you will need an adapter fitting this guy right here. Uh, BLF-26C, that's solid brass, grabbed it from AutoZone. Um, so I grabbed both master cylinders and I thought, you know what, we'll be able to bolt this right on and be on the road with really improved braking. But the one thing I failed to research enough into was the fact that this conversion only works on a GMT 400 truck if you have vacuum boost brakes, which guess what? I have Hydro Boost. Now Hydro Boost normally is a braking upgrade. It provides more pressure than a vacuum booster can, but Evidently on these OBS Chevy trucks, there is a slight difference in the size of the master cylinder bore, or not the bore of the master cylinder, but where it fits into the booster. Uh, they're different between Hydro Boost and Vacuum Boost. Now that will focus and if I can hold this still. I kind of have the master cylinder loose and you can see that shiny silver aluminum in there that's normally covered up. On an OBS Hydro Boost, that measures in at like 1.500. We're on the new body style Chevy master cylinders. These measure in at one 800. So there's about 300 thousandths of an inch difference. This 2500 HD master cylinder has an inch and a half bore. So I'd have to basically chop that entire outside boss off to make this one work. This one with a one and three eighths inch bore, I probably could grind a lot of this away and I'd have about a 16th of an inch on each side, which I don't love that idea. The other option would be to grind out the master cylinder bore or the, um, sorry, the Hydro Boost little recessed area. Also don't want to do that. So I think what I'm ultimately going to do is hop on the junkyards or just grab a new uh, Hydro Boost from a GMT 800 truck. Now it's not a direct bolt on. I'll probably have to make some adapter or just modify the plate that bolted onto the firewall. I know sometimes you can unscrew the mounting plate from one and put it on the other. I'll probably have to mess around with a little push rod that attaches to the brake pedal. Uh, but I'm not gonna do any of that right now simply because like I mentioned a minute ago, my front right caliper has a twisted off bleeder screw and I don't wanna buy another caliper because I'm ultimately gonna be replacing everything in the front brakes and upgrading it to GMT 800 stuff as well. More or less what you do is you put some 2500 spindles on there, which lets you use the 2500 bearings, the bigger brakes, the twin piston calipers up front. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll work on the Hydro Boost and figure out how to get a good master cylinder on this. So that way I have all basically GMT 800 um, Hydro Boost brakes. So we'll tackle that at a future point. Um, but for now, let's talk about how much this whole conversion for the rear axle costs, and then we'll get out on the road, see if it actually was worth it and see if the truck will even drive. So I always keep spreadsheets of all the projects that I do just for some weird reason. I like to keep track of stuff. Um, so you start at the top and the big ticket item clearly was the rear axle. That one cost $1,060, I believe. And I did use carpart.com, the junkyard finder website or whatever, but the only place I could find the Dana 70 410 limited slip that I wanted was in New York. So that includes probably 300 bucks of shipping to get this thing on a pallet and get it across the country from New York to Utah. 
Um, so yeah, the big ticket item axle, $1,060. From there, we go down the list, rear shocks for $157. Um, the power stop brake kit, that was $250. And then there was a lot of little things that add up after that. You know, you've got parking brake shoes, spring perches, shock mounts, backing plates, because all that stuff was rusted out. Um, you know, brake, brake flex hoses, parking brake arm, wheel seals, and even the gear oil and the hard line. All that stuff adds up and I keep track of basically every penny I spend on every project because I guess I'm OCD like that. Uh, but the total for this one was $1,776 and some change. So uh, that's a good freedom number right there, $1,776, right? But um, that's the price that I had to pay to satisfy my OCD of not wanting to use wheel spacers and having an axle that was the right width. Now, I think I added up in a previous video what it would have cost if I wanted to modify the 14 bolt to get all the things that I gained by going with the Dana 60. So I would have had to start it out with wheel spacers. And the only ones I would have gone with was those, uh, I think they're made by Bora, they're steel, they're CNC machined. And I think those are a couple hundred bucks a piece. A good limited slip, like a Detroit True Track for the 14 bolt, that's probably 600 bucks. And then I would have gone through and done a couple of bearings, refreshed the brakes, or done a disc brake conversion. Um, but, and I think it total came into like 12 or 1300 bucks. So I'm about four to $500 more than that by going with the Dana 70, but here's what I get. And here's why I wanted to do it. Number one, I hate wheel spacers. I know you can run them. Some people say you can run them safely. Some people don't love wheel spacers. I'm in the second category. I don't love them, even though they would work. Um, so I don't have to run spacers and I get factory disc brakes where if you do a disc brake conversion on a 14 bolt, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that, but most of the conversions use like C10 single piston calipers back there where I much prefer the dual piston caliper because I'm upgrading the fronts as well. Um, so in my opinion, I'm getting a much heavier duty complete package. So I'm really happy with the route that I took. Yes, it was expensive, but it's part of modifying cars is you got to spend some money. And I'm really, really happy with how this one turned out. So now let's get this thing out on the road and see if it, number one, will even drive in a straight line because that's probably pretty important. Okay, so my very first impression of driving this thing is, well, for the most part, it's exactly like it was before. The only real difference I notice is that it rides a little bit smoother, and that's mainly just because I have brand new shocks on the back to replace the old worn out ones. So I'm happy that it rides better, but I'm also happy that it drives exactly the same way that it did before. I mean, just having a little bit wider rear wheel it's not making any difference for how this thing drives down a straight road. Now, the one thing I will say is the steering in this thing is like way sloppy to begin with before I did anything to the axle. I mean, to maintain a straight line, you kind of got to work the wheel back and forth. And that hasn't changed, which of course it wouldn't. Um, and down the road, I am going to completely redo the front end. I'll probably do like a redhead steering box, go through all new tie rods, ball joints, bushings, everything uh, when I do the GMT 800 brake upgrade. But anyway, yeah, in terms of how the truck drives now with this Chevy Express axle, pretty much exactly the same. So the next thing is stopping power. Did we gain any stopping power? So um, right now we have the stock GMT 400 disc drum master cylinder with a stock hydro boost. And I will say I noticed it is a little bit, the pedal, it feels like there's still a little bit of air in there. I bled everything that I felt like I could. I know a lot of guys just talk about deleting that whole ABS block altogether, and maybe we'll do that, but um, we should have, in theory, a little better stopping power with disc brakes on the back. So what I'm doing, uh, I'm going 55, I'll bring it up to like 60 miles an hour, and I'll just stand on the brakes and see what happens. So we're doing 60, here we go. All right, so the ABS kicked in, it kind of halfway locked up the tires, so I wasn't even sure if ABS still worked or not. Um, but it seemed to stop pretty good, like in a panic situation. I guess anytime, if you could stop and it locks up the tires, well, that means the brakes are working pretty darn good. Um, the back did not lock up, from what I could tell, before the front, it stopped pretty straight. Um, yeah, the pedal, like I said, it is a little bit spongy still, but like I said, we get an old master cylinder, we get the ABS block hanging in there. I know you can bleed those with like the little, you can put a scan tool on them and get them to actuate, so maybe I'll do that at some point, but 
for now, I'm really happy with how it stops for having just the stock master cylinder, stock hydro boost, and the new brakes up back. So I declare this conversion a success. So I set a camera up on the side of the road on a tripod. I just wanted to see if I could get a good shot of it, like locking up the brakes or coming to a stop just to you know, see how it looks from the outside. And the first time I hit the brake pedal too early because I wasn't sure how quickly it would stop. Um, so I did it a second time and it actually surprised me how quickly it did come to a complete stop. It didn't lock the tires up and I was standing on the brake pedal just about as hard as I could. Um, so yeah, major improvement I'm gonna say, or not major, but a pretty significant improvement over stock in terms of braking power. Handling is pretty much unchanged. We get a smoother ride quality from the newer shocks. Um, and of course we have that new, much, much better looking stance. My OCD is now satisfied, at least for a little while longer. So that's gonna bring this video to an end, and you guys know what to do. If you don't mind, click that subscribe button. Click the like button and drop a comment down below because all that stuff helps the channel grow. It helps the algorithm work and all that good stuff. So I'd really appreciate the help. Um, in the next video, I'm either, I got a couple options. I'm still kind of tossing around what I'm going to do. I have some different injectors and a regulator for this. I might throw that stuff in. Also, I have one of those Cunningham machine bronze door pin bushings for the driver's side or passenger side over there. Might throw that in. Totally not sure. Um, but either way, check back in another couple days for another upload.